Azure Data Factory and what is Azure Data Bricks and how we can um, work together. Um, I've got a bunch of slides in here. Not going to drain all the slides. I'll give a high level overview of a data factory and then we'll just go inside. And I'll show you uh, build some uh, demos for you guys. I'll show you guys and uh, please do if you have any questions. Stop me and ask or uh, please put it in the chat window. Be glad, glad to answer any questions. Um, so what is data factory? So data factory, uh, as you all know, um, data uh, processing data is been there for a long time. But what is what was the challenge in uh, the existing systems? Um, the one challenge that I've always seen over my uh, career is um, processing data faster and a scalable manner. Uh, yes, there are systems like Informatica, Ab Initio, data stages, and other things that were able to do a scalable compute. Um, but still, it was extremely expensive and it was not on, de on demand. Um, so I'm going to stress that concept of on demand, and there is a reason for that. Um, when Microsoft started thinking about it, uh, we did have SSIS as an ETL, which is traditionally uh, our ETL tool, but we wanted to build something for the next generation that is cloud scale. Um, what does that mean? Uh, so we came up with this concept of data factory as an orchestration tool um, for a lot of uh, ELT uh, based workload. That's how it started. What is ELT? Um, extract and load and then transform. Because the reason is like uh, data factory doesn't have a compute engine, which I'll talk to you about. Now, when we started creating that, uh, what we wanted to do is like, we want to give you a um, nice uh, scalable uh, uh, platform for computes uh, managed by uh, Microsoft. And it's, uh, and it's uh, uh, trusted, of course. Um, and then we wanted to provide a nice drag and drop UI to, um, to do the uh, development work. Um, and our goal is not to write code, uh, but you can also extend with code using functions and Databricks and things like that. This is where Databricks adds power to it. Um, most of uh, our scenarios have been uh, cloud-based and also hybrid. And you can ask me why hybrid. The reason is like if it is if it is cloud-based companies. They already are built in cloud. It's easy to go from cloud to cloud, but we do cover a lot of enterprise systems, which means we have to provide an hybrid model, um, which is basically ability to connect to SAP, uh, Salesforce, Salesforce Cloud, uh, you name it. We have about like 100 or so connectors. I'll show you guys. So that's basically what Data Factory is on a very high level. Um, the one thing I want to come back is that compute part. Uh, the compute part is like the challenge has always been compute. Um, when moving data from point A to point B, um, there are multiple ways you can move the data. You can move data uh, one event at a time, like how Kafka and uh, uh, other um, uh, high speed like RabbitMQ and things like that does, or you can optimize and move bulk data to do bulk processing. Uh, individual record takes time, whereas parallel multiple micro batch parallel processing will be very efficient. So that's that's why this tool was built to be uh, or data orchestration, data movement, and ELT tool. You bring the data in, and then to do the processing, you we ADF doesn't have any compute. Uh, Azure Data Factory is sometimes we call it as ADF, ADF. Um, now, for compute, we depend on external systems, like either we go to Databricks uh, to spawn the cluster and use the compute power from there, or HD Insights, that's another compute power, or Synapse uh, Analytics, uh, which has the serverless option and the dedicated, uh, dedicated pool option that you can pick and choose from. So the idea is like compute can be ad hoc uh, provisioned and utilized, but at least have the governance monitoring everything built in a centralized location. So that's why this tool is extremely popular with our customers. And I've worked in it for more than five years. 
Um, so to give you a high level, why we are looking at uh, Data Factory is like Data Factory is kind of like our tool to manage the entire data processing lifecycle, uh, which means the ingest, the store, prep, and um, model and so. That is exactly what we actually concentrate on. Now it can connect to different systems. It can do various transformation. Uh, can it do all the transformation? No, uh, it depends on um, the compute that we are going to use and how we want it to uh, use. Now, as, as we evolved, we also added a new feature called data flow. Sometimes it's also referred to as mapping flow. Um, that is our um, Spark enabled backend to do uh, drag and drop um, processing work, um, which is like I'll, I'll, when I show you, you guys will be able to see it. Um, any questions? Does this make sense? Okay. Yes. Um, so we can do various uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, I'll share you the deck, no problem. Um, on a high level, uh, this is a very, very, very common pattern that we see across uh, all our customers. Data Factory becomes your source of bringing uh, bulk data. By any means, um, this engine is not made to do uh, real-time uh, event-driven operations. It's all uh, purely to do bulk operations. I can load a terabyte data from SAP without any problem. Um, doesn't come through any queue or anything like that, but it does the job extremely well. We can parallelize it, pull the data out, and, and do so uh, CDC and process and build all the data models for Data Hub or Data Vault or any um, the data serving technology you guys want to use. It, uh, the new one doesn't even support Delta as well. Um, so that's basically, this is the very common pattern that we see. Um, from now, next, what we did is like, since we had SSIS, we also have a lift and shift operation. Now, this actually, um, um, SSIS is very, very, very uh, easy to lift and shift, except any uh, without any dependency. The few things that you have to watch out is like, if you're using third-party dependencies, or if you're using CLRs, um, or something like, like if you're using for SMTP to email and things like that, those are the things needs to be refactored. But reminding code inside SSIS can, uh, can be lift and shifted, and we use, um, SQL MI as our uh, um, package store to deploy. And at that point onwards, we use the integration runtime to run all your, um, uh, run the ETL part of it. Now, this is traditionally not a cloud-bound system, so that's why it's running in a, uh, in a VM. Um, and then uh, we also have um, our data factory has an option to go out across um, uh, multiple other, uh, on the right side, you can see the clouds, uh, but not only the cloud, but also the business, you may call it business clouds or uh, business process clouds or business softwares. Uh, all these workforce, Adobe and all, um, Salesforce and all are like becoming more and more um, in, an, in a web-based SaaS kind of model. So we can also go um, uh, pull data from there. And also we can do on-prem sources like Oracle, Teradata, Hortonworks, SQL Server, yes. Um, but SAP also, SAP we can do BW and HANA as well. Um, now let's talk about the connectors. Uh, when you talk about connectors, th this is what we have, and this space is growing uh, as we see demand on more and more connectors. Um, all, almost uh, all the first party, except for the Dynamics 365, we have connectors. And then we have connectors for all BigQuery, uh, Sybase, Greenplum, Hive, Impala. Um, I don't want to drain this slide. This gives you an idea of like what are all is connected, uh, connectors we have. Um, doesn't have every connector that other tools like Talon has, but we try to concentrate on the most um, enterprise ready, what would be uh, really needed for the enterprise. Um, that being said, what do we do in uh, Data Factory? So Data Factory, as I said, is an orchestration engine. It's gonna have a UI. Um, 
And inside the UI, uh, UI, we can say like, OK, do this step one, do step two, do step three, and then go do step five and then come back and do step four. Kind of like that you can act, uh, you can you can orchestrate it and you can also cascade pipelines. That's what we call it as pipeline. Uh, one workflow can be a pipeline and you can take pipelines and put pipelines together and make it cascading pipeline or parallel uh, pipeline as well. Um, this is a lot more. This is all like let's go uh, go through this. Um, now let's get back into. Uh, I'm gonna go back directly. Okay. Um, let me show you. This is this will make sense. So this is our data factory. Um, when you come in here, you're gonna see like we have like a few pipelines um, samples in here that we can use. You will see the uh, SSIS integration here. Uh, create pipeline is where we are going to do. Uh, we are going to start with and create a data flow. Uh, now I'll explain a little bit data flow here before I go into that. Um, data flow is our ETL type uh, ETL slash ELT. The reason why I'm saying ETL slash ELT is like you do coding like ETL, drag and drop. Um, I should show you um, so you can see now this is an a traditional um, dimension and uh, fact model. Um, so I can actually um, load everything, um, use GUI to do the joins and build my uh, fact and I can actually sync, sync this as an output. Now, even though this is a UI, uh, there is no execution behind this, except the execution is handed over to an on-demand uh, data factory cluster, which actually in turn runs it in Spark. Um, that's basically how uh, data factory will work. So let's go back here. And I'll show you this. So this is something we call it as a pipeline. Um, a pipeline is an empty canvas. And if you look at it, here are all the operators that we have. Um, you can do move, you can do data flow, and I'll show you that. Um, there are also, these are all the uh, operators and variables, like you can execute a pipeline inside, inside a pipeline. Um, you can do various orchestration by looking up, or we can actually do like a web, uh, web, uh, website lookup. This is how we usually use for, if we have to get, um, any um, like a token, like AD authentication and get tokens and pass them through, we can. Uh, now also in the pipeline itself, there is a concept called data flow debug. This is a new feature that we added. Uh, what it does is like it gives you a small, um, a small like an, um, um, like a computer, mini, uh, mini Spark engine uh, container computer that you can visualize and see the data while you're doing the transformation. And this is only for debug. Uh, the way that we execute is like we build a pipeline and then we usually do add trigger. You can trigger now or you can schedule a trigger. This is time bound. Uh, usually minimum we say 15 minutes. Uh, hourly schedule is good. The lowest you can go is like 15 minutes. You can schedule it and it will run it. And I'll show you why this tool is so popular, so powerful uh, later in the case. Now, here in my scenario, what I wanted to show you guys is like, as we all know, we are going into that intelligent data platform world, right? So we have a need, but we can't get rid of the existing old, um, our traditional data warehousing for reporting and insights because we need the data. Data drives insights. So. To, to, to collect the data, we still have to do some sort of an ETL and processing work. So what I thought is like, okay, how would a how would a new company will do it? Like you collect data from multitude of sources and then and then actually get everything ready, pass it on to the data engineering, which is your analytical team that which is going to do like, hey, I wanted to do customer customer insights, I wanted to do churn analysis, or I wanted to do co-sell upsell. I wanted to do uh, uh, how much how much churn is going to cost me like you know I mean usually churns are extremely expensive in terms of sales side of it um, but then you can do a lot more predictive maintenance forecasting demand forecasting supply forecasting materials and 
things like that. Still, how do you orchestrate all those and, and get things together? So what I did is like, um, here is a sample, uh, cost, uh, like a population data. This is pretty much available online from our uh, uh, data.gov. Um, took those and uh, uh, split it into like um, facts and dimensions. Um, and then I'm showing you like how how the entire uh, fact table is actually created by joining all of this and aggregated here. Uh, this is a very uh, simplistic flow of showing like how a data warehouse is formed uh, in the data lake. Now, everything that I'm using here is all coming from our ADLS Gen 2 storage, and it's all sitting in Parquet format. Um, there are techniques inside here that we can actually parallelize it um, based on partitions. And you can uh, actually, that's what they call optimize here. Uh, since it's Spark, uh, um, it usually follows the Spark based um, of parallelization uh, concept in here. Does this make sense so far? Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah, I think it does. Sorry, everybody's been. Okay. <laughs> <I'm mute. laughs> uh, perfect. So now let's talk about. Um, so there are other. Um, I have a bunch of pipelines. Um, so you can see, like, I mean, we can do uh, um, various, various uh, logics in here. Now, this one is like uh, going to our OAuth, getting a token, and then it is passing it into. Um, into a uh, Azure notebook. I mean, we use this pattern a lot in uh, um, in Accenture right now. Um, and then this is like we have a service called Common Data Model, which uh, which is a predefined schema that we have for some of the domains, um, business domains, and you can persist the data in that particular schema in the uh, business domain to build like business models. Um, so there are there are. Uh, I don't want to drain everything, but you guys can see, right? I can actually cascade data flows inside data flows, and I can do like a go through this sequence, or you can do go through this parallel. Uh, now, data flow gives you an advantage because it's Spark based, so you can parallelly scale. Um, but usually, the other regular uh, operators that we use, say for example, if you pick like a um, get metadata or uh, HTTP and things like that. That uses what we call the integration runtime. So we basically uh, spin a VM uh, in this case. What is that? Yeah, this one um, basically will spin a VM, uh, which is run in the cloud itself. It's called the auto resolve runtime. And it actually basically connects it, and we use that for the compute. Uh, so you have both the options to uh, use. And here, um, we, in security-wise, we are also um, most of this are connected with MSI, and I wanted to showcase that because that's one one of the main um, reason um, Accenture we use this a lot inside uh, the Yakuta's team. Like every connection that we use, uh, we use managed identity to connect to each other, um, and once and we can test it over here. So let me show you. Um, so let me give you a rundown. Uh, so this is our management plane for here, and you can add source and destinations here. Um, these are all the source that is available for our disposal. Right from GitHub to HDFS to um, Salesforce to S3 to Office 365 to SAP, oh, we do have an ECC also, um, and SFTP. Now, these th these are what we call the connectors. Uh, it can be source or sync. Not all of them uh, source will have all of them as a sync. Uh, there will be some differences, and you're all you're also going to see a difference between uh, data movement. These connectors are used for data movement. And data uh, flow has got a little bit lesser connections. Um, can actually add and show you here. So you can just drag and drop, click here, and click new. 
And here are your uh, data source, um, data flow connectors that are available. Uh, we can move anything from here. The ones with grayed out are not available. Um, but our goal is to slowly, slowly, slowly enable all of these things. Um, right now, we are concentrating a lot more uh, using the data, data bricks, and building the data lake, uh, delta lake. So that's why you see all our first parties are enabled here, but this list will also become same as of the copy list. And this is going to grow. Now that, now well, the other thing that I want you guys to know is like, all these that I'm doing um, is connected to my GitHub repo as well. And there is an option to connect to uh, GitHub, or you can actually connect to um, Azure DevOps. Um, I'm connecting GitHub. This this is where I maintain all my code. So all this uh, all the uh, changes that I do, I can save and I can publish. Um, once you build a pipeline, unless you save. Um, and you publish it, you won't be able to execute it. In the debug, uh, you can execute it without publishing itself. Um, so what happens in publishing is like it takes a copy and it creates a uh, production ready version of it and maintain it in a separate branch and that's what gets uh, pushed into. So now this is um, a very simple um, or a, on a high level data factory. Does this make sense? Awesome. Um, so now, now let's 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 go back because um, I skipped all those slides because I wanted to show you. Um, let's talk about this now. Um, what is new when we introduced? We had a version one and version two, um, but let's see what what's what was new in version two. When we released version two, we had control flow, which is what I was uh, showing you the pipeline and you can cascade the pipeline and build uh, for each iterations and things like that. Uh, flexible scheduling, even based scheduling, like you can trigger when, uh, when like a, a blob, a file is dropped or something like that. And then we can uh, add the integration runtime um, for on-prem as well. Um, now, I'll cover the next slide and then I'll go back and I'll show you something. Um, Data Factory is designed to be an ad hoc uh, system. So you use it when you want it. You're not running it for 24 by seven. So we don't do ETL, for running ETL operations, we don't run any compute 24 by seven. When you submit the job, we spun up the resources and then we actually execute it, shut it down and come out. That's why it becomes super powerful and super cost effective. On-demand uh, ETL processing. We also added uh, global parameters uh, so that you can actually make it a reusable template and re reuse it for multiple ETL operations as well. We also have uh, capabilities to do like create a watermark table for uh, uh, control operation to know like when we left off last time and then go back and pick only the change data so that you're not we're not always every day we are not always loading all the data again and again uh, on demand spark uh, we used to have hd insights but now we we prefer more on the data brick side over here now i'll show you what's the the other best part is like now you, i i show you i i saw i mean i showed you this right now the spark stuff i didn't go detail i'll come back to it but if you come back here, there is a monitor section. So this is where um, you know, Data Factory uh, beats everybody else. It actually uh, shows us like an uh, amazing monitoring dashboard. I can go in, I can come inside here, and I can actually pull and I can see each one of the step, how it went. If it errored out, actually I should show you the one with error. Um, so, I was trying a couple of options for you guys to show, and one of them was this. And you can see, like in this, uh, each one is considered a task. Um, each task could be multiple tasks inside as well. Like you can come here. This is a task by itself. So if you do uh, you know, flow details, it is going to show you all the details. And you can actually see the statistics of 
how much it got, uh, nah, how much time it took, how many rows it processed, like 2 million rows it processed in here, and how much time it took, stage time. It actually gives you all these uh, details. Now, let's go back to the activity run. Um, and that's that's because it's an expanded uh, process by itself. Now for individual one also, you can actually look at it. Uh, since it's a data bricks, it's going to uh, take you take us to a different environment, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you that real quick. Um, so as you can see, like you can see each stage is how much time it took, and when it errors out, um, it may not be all the errors you're going to see, but it is pretty decent enough to tell us like what it is going to be. Uh, in Databricks, if it errors out, you're going to go into this output here, and if I click this, it will take me to that particular run job. Um, now, this now I'm taking you away from Data Factory, and I'm go I'm taking you directly into uh, Databricks. Let's come back to that later. Um, so this these are the, uh, some of the options that we have in Data Factory, and this is why it makes it very powerful. So when we run uh, pipelines for months and months and months. Uh, we usually store it for, I think, like six months or so. Uh, but you can actually go back and see uh, every day if you're running a job, you can go back and see which jobs failed, and you can actually even restart that job at, at the failed point also, rerun from failed point as well. Um, you have all these admin options in a centralized location to manage and monitor. We don't have to push this to any external system, but this is this is why the cloud scale uh, uh, helps you because this is we are not going to um, everything behind the scenes is taken care of by the ADF itself. Um, now this is super important when I've seen a lot of production people um, rely on this to see like hey what happened, and we also have an alerting metric that you can uh, set up rules to say like hey if something fails please do send an email out. Um, so if the job fails, I can say like, okay, send it to Bala so I can come and take take a look at it. Um, data flow debug. This is where if, if the Spark jobs are failing uh, and if you're seeing any errors, it is going to pop populate in here. In my case, I didn't, I mean, I had a very canned demo, so there is no errors, so you're not going to be able to see it. So now, if you're okay, um, so this is what, data factory on a very high level is. Um, usually copy activity is what a lot of people use because we can actually um, do like um, click, 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 copy. Um, and you can actually parallelize that. There is the maximum parallelization is like you can do 32 nodes. Uh, so give you an example that I copied from uh, West US to East US. Um, from Microsoft, uh, one data center to one of the data center, and I was copying like a couple of uh, terabyte of data. Uh, this one, um, so you can see the source is going to be uh, from an uh, TPCH uh, file, um, which is all Parquet files, and destination. Uh, this was like uh, my 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 storage account. Um, this job took about uh, four hours to copy. I believe um, close to 3.6 terabytes. Um, I do have the statistic. It was around like 250 megs per second. Uh, it was copying, um, and I didn't have to babysit. I just had to run it and go, and automatically, um, when everything ran, I was able to come and uh, uh, check this, and it was here. Let me see if I can find. Uh, Pardon my errors. <laughs> uh, might need to go back more. Let's see. So far, does it make sense? Okay. Uh, so here is here is the last one that got succeeded. So you can see um, when I copy, uh, I can go back and look at the details. Um, it's going to tell you. 
So you copied from US to region west two to central US. Um, copied about 3.4 terabytes uh, parquet file, uh, peak connections 80. And here is your throughput. Um, now you can see the scale parallelism. That's what we call it as DIU units. Um, and this is 16 parallelism, uh, 16 and maximum we can go up to 32 uh, in the default configuration, but then there is a higher level configuration you can do to also scale that 32 to more also. Um, the 16 and 32 didn't make any difference. It was the same timing, which pretty much told me that I capped at the wire level. Um, so that's basically like, that's why this tool is super, uh, super, super useful for moving large volume of data sets. Um, so that being said, now let's go back to uh, Databricks. So Databricks, um, as you all know, it's the uh, it's a company by itself, but we have done a first party product with them um, to bring Spark into our ecosystem. Uh, now, now you can ask me what's the difference between Databricks Spark and uh, open source Spark. Um, the Spark part of it is not going to be uh, differentiated, but Databricks has what is called the Databricks runtime. The way how they cl create the cluster, manage the cluster, how they optimize the node for Spark within the cluster. Those are some of those things that differentiates what Databricks does very well. Um, a Spark code is a Spark code. And I know that very well because I've taken the same Spark code that I ran here, and then I was able to run it in our Microsoft Spark and HD Inside Spark. Um, and it's not going to change. So Spark-wise, there won't be much, uh, but Databricks is also one of the major contributor for Spark. And they are also the ones who are building uh, Delta Engine which helps us in terms of like caching and helping um, um, making the ETL faster so that the, the, the whole goal is to, um, I mean, even though we have to code, the whole goal is like to reduce the amount of time development is done so that we can and we can go to market faster. That's what on a high level data breaks is. Uh, architecture level, I have different slides. If you want, I can show you. Don't know whether I have it here. Um, before I go there, I want to show you one more thing. So ADF is certified here. Uh, you can see like um, we have the HIPAA, ISO, CSA star and all. Uh, the remaining ones are more marketing and too technical, but I'll come back here. Okay. So let's talk about Databricks. Um, Databricks um, allows us uh, to use uh, Spark uh, in a scalable fashion. More, more than scalable, it gives us the parallel processing compute. Um, why is that very important? Is like when, when you start processing 10 terabytes, one petabytes and things like that, we can only go so much vertical scale. That, that's why systems like SAP HANA or Oracle's uh, um, uh, the the uh, data box Teradata, or um, they have Exadata, or uh, Microsoft used to have APS. They're all big, huge rack servers. They 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 stop at one point because uh, horizontal uh, vertical scale you can go only so much. Depends on the blades and number of blades available. Um, it's a, it's it's physics. But here we can do horizontal scale, um, and we don't the Best part is we don't have to write anything for doing the horizontal scale. If we use this Spark framework, uh, just using that, uh, just a regular Spark command, under the cover Spark will actually expand that for us. Uh, and this became very popular extremely for machine learning use cases at one point because that's where we needed a lot of lot, lot and lot more compute. But now I'm also seeing that this has been used for lots and lots of uh, data workloads these days. Um, this is becoming the modern data architecture. Spark is becoming the compute for modern data platforms. Um, and of course, it's trusted. Uh, they have the role-based access controls. They also integrate with Active Directory for logins and UI and things like that. They have this interactive workspace. Um, 
couple of people can uh, log in and collaborate and build notebooks together and share and it can also connect to github to maintain like code repo and uh, um, maintain like you know for, for ci cd purpose and also versioning code versioning so those are also available on it um what so now let's spill the a little bit on spark uh spark a uh, comparison is hadoop is not really a good comparison but still hadoop's uh, biggest flaw was it was using hard disk uh, to do the computation also uh, computations uh, temporary storage was uh, in in the in the uh, hard disk layer so it was heavily dependent on your hard disk um, spark on the other hand data frame is their basic uh, basic mechanism of how they pull the data out um, data frame basically pulls it up and stores it in the in memory and that's why uh, and it also it, it does in distributed in memory so it can actually do computation much faster. Um, widely acceptable in the open source community because it also has like a SQL syntax. Uh, it also supports, um, okay, let me, I'll come to that later. So uh, the batch processing, interactive, you have SQL, you can do Spark streaming for real time. Uh, machine learning and deep learning are extremely getting very popular. Uh, graph processing has been there for more than five years now. Um, that's also um, uh, graph is literally fast in uh, uh, faster in actually Spark. Um, why Spark is also they they support bunch of other uh, um, software packages like you can do Python, you can do uh, Scala, you can if you're a SQL developer you can do Spark SQL. If you're a graph developer you can do graph based queries. So. It become and and they also support R now, and they also have like PyTorch, TensorFlow. Um, all these packages are supported. Uh, TensorFlow uh, can be distributed with Horowitz. PyTorch, as of now, uh, you can't distribute that much. And then they have they came up with Covalis recently, which is basically taking uh, Python's data frame and parallelizing it behind the scene. So we can do crazy amount of use cases like click stream, video speech, uh, customer data, customer data, custom data models and things like that, or with IoT. And it also has native connectivity to Kafka's and uh, Kafka's of the world and uh, other uh, open source tools. Uh, we have connectors to ADLS Gen 2, we have connectors to S3, um, we were able to connect to BigQuery, so a lot of other uh, advantages are there as well. Now, Spark, on the other hand, is not a codeless approach. It's an it's a programmable approach of doing uh, uh, ELT and ETL work, but it gives you the flexibility to customize it to your needs. Um, this is just an uh, how big data and machine learning are coming together. Um, ultimately, uh, when when we have a big data system. Uh, Spark is only extremely good if you have data sets which are at least minimum couple of terabytes and you wanted to run machine learning. Anything uh, less than terabyte and all, a regular Python like Azure machine learning will do work better for you guys. Um, but if you have like terabytes and petabytes of data, then Spark will be your best engine to get, get the workload done. Um, that Does that make sense? So here are other uh, few features. Um, the Databricks is also built to be an ad hoc, uh, uh, ad hoc system. Uh, that means preferably with, uh, if, if you're not using only for streaming use cases, um, the cluster will be running 24 by seven. For remaining everything else, what we do is when, the, when, when we have an ETL job, um, we offload the compute, uh, uh, compute uh, the job to the compute, and compute gets spun up. Uh, so it usually takes about like two to three minutes to get uh, get everything. Sometimes it takes five minutes if it is a beginning uh, to set up the uh, VM, to acquire VM, and then it also installs all the Spark component to it, runs the job, and you can shut it down. So that's the advantage. This uh, extremely allows you to save a lot of money as well. And of course, the language of your choice, Python, R, Scala, SQL. It has a collaborative notebook space, which I'll show you guys. Um, 
show you all. And then it also is secured because it's Azure Databricks. So we have uh, AD uh, uh, plugged in. So when I logged in, it uses my AD, AD account of Microsoft. It has uh, some fine grain uh, uh, permissions within the platform itself. Uh, this doesn't tie to the um, the, the IAM, the uh, identity access management that we have in the portal yet. Uh, it's a trusted platform and it is enterprise grade. And the clusters you can uh, scale from two nodes to 100 nodes, depending on depending on the subscription limits. Um, if you want more, you can actually also expand on that as well. So now, um, so I sh uh, this is in a simple data flow, um, a data flow decision making process that I did for Accenture itself. Um, I don't know if Yakuta is on the call or not, but um, this was for the AIA data lake. Uh, we did this um, just to give you an idea of like, hey, what decisions to take when based on the use case. Uh, the entire goal was like to uh, to build a uh, cost effective system with high performance as the whole entire goal is. Um, the remaining slides we have, this is the uh, Azure Data Factory integration runtime, which I spoke about. Um, I'll share you guys this. Um, I have a few customer evidence slides. Now, that also I'll share, no problem. Uh, let's go back to Databricks now. So this is this is the Databricks environment. Um, as you can see, even Data Factory has its own UI. Uh, Databricks also has its own UI. Uh, now I can uh, I can join and work on here. Robin can join and work with me. Uh, Neil can also join and work with me. The way that we uh, we do development here is called um, uh, Workspace is the logical space. Um, as you see, like it's per user, it'll create an um, uh, like a uh, uh, like a directory structure, and then it'll inside that I can have any number of uh, any number of folders, and I can keep working on and building code whatever I like. Um, so I'm going to show you a very simple um, processing. So the first one, the first thing that I did is here is where we create the clusters. Um, now. There, there, there is, a, I think, for a workspace, there were the hundred. There is a limit in the how many clusters you can create, but you can have individual clusters. So you can see, like, when I join, then it's going to show my name and it's attached to my email because um, it's been connected to my AD account here. So that's that's how it is secured. Uh, now I can create my new cluster. Uh, I have variation of it. It has, uh, you can see the runtime. This is where you have all these uh, latest versions of Spark 3.1. Compute option, you have both GPU and CPU, depending on it. Um, the, the nodes, uh, worker nodes, minimum and maximum. Here, um, may, the minimum recommendation is three nodes. Um, that's what uh, usually Hadoop follows. It's the three nodes. Uh, Three nodes for HA purpose. Uh, maximum node is up to up to up to the workload. What we wanted to do, um, and then just make sure that the driver node at least is same as of a worker node or better than the worker node. So driver is like the master node. This is where uh, Spark Spark is going to monitor all the jobs that are doing and reporting back. So it has some overhead over here. Um, once you create this cluster, I can come in here. I can open up a notebook. Um, there are so many, um, there is a, a, a list of uh, um, samples, documentations I can send it to you guys for testing, no problem. Um, since I'm, I, I like more Scala, um, since I come from C-Sharp background, uh, I'm using Scala as my notebook of choice, um, and I'm attaching the cluster here, uh, but you can also, it's not really necessary that I have to use Scala. You can use Python. Python means it becomes PySpark. So it allows you to use parallel processing for Python as well. Now, if I start coming in here, I can just, uh, once I have the cluster ready, uh, I can write the code here and I can run it and I can visualize it here and I can troubleshoot it here. So this is basically like the Spark IDE per se. Um, one way of doing Spark IDE. Um, well known for 
people in the open source world for Python and uh, and data science community they they are used in the notebook. It's a Jupyter notebook, but it's it's much more uh, um, like an up uh, uh, like an uh, much more a uh, uh, better notebook is what they created. And there is also a revision here um, that we can do. You can see what are all the changes that I've done. So you can see how I've just I've been working since morning. Um, but not only that, um, this can also be attached to um, attached to a GitHub repo. Um, what that means is like um, I can connect my code to a GitHub, uh, this is my repository. I've connected to my GitHub repo and it is always synced. So my code revisioning is not only maintained in Databricks, but my GitHub will also make sure that I have the revisions there. That option is also available. So we can take this from the GitHub and use CI CD methodology to push it to uh, different environments and follow the um, SDLC process. Um, that being said, um, so you can see uh, it's going to create the, uh, even though we are writing this code, um, internally uh, Spark is going to create some jobs and it's going to distribute the jobs across all the nodes and it's going to uh, execute it and it's going to bring it back to us. And we don't have to do anything. Um, the, the system does it by itself. Uh, it's, it's parallelizing our work but I never wrote any code to do parallelism here. This is the power of uh, Databricks itself. One gotcha is uh, it is code based. Um, yes, you need skill. Um, you need to know how to write code, optimized code. That is one, one gap that I see. There are Spark by itself. Um, it's a huge, big domain. I don't want to go too um, crazy deep into it. Uh, but you can see the idea like what what we are doing here right now once I build this what I can do in data factory is I can use my data factory to be my orchestration engine now that is what these are all about so what I can say is like I can do a notebook for data engineering I can say like okay go run the data engineering notebook only if it is successful go to the next one so there is a uh, there is a where is it okay sorry here um if you look at this um it will tell you on success on failure on on completion on skipped so i can say like if my data warehouse is complete fine uh, i can go run my data engineering and on data engineering success go do my machine learning model which is basically um basically the can, uh, the code is uh, so this is the model. Uh, this is the basically the machine learning code that I was running. Um, it's an uh, it's a text based uh, NLP model. It's using that in uh, uh, ML. Oh no, wait. My bad. Apologies. Where is ML lib? Ah. So this one, um, this is the native Spark machine learning libra libraries, uh, logistic regression. I believe it is logistic regression if I'm correct. Yeah, logistic regression. So um, this is a basic uh, machine learning algorithm. The algorithm itself is parallelized internally. So all we have to do is just call the algorithm, pass our features and uh, uh, columns, uh, labels, and we are good to go. So this one line code to do parallelism, if we decide to do by ourselves, that might be like 100 lines of code. Um, so you can see how it actually helps you fast ETL development, but in a parallel fashion. Now, data factory using orchestration is advantageous because you can control the flow and you can actually build all those orchestration in it. So when you combine these two, it becomes extremely super combination. Um, I haven't seen any situations that we couldn't do yet. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there might be some, but this is how both of these tools come together. Was it was it helpful? Yeah, very helpful. Too quiet. 
Is anybody there? <laughs> uh, this is really cool. Okay. Um, so now, when you run this um, no, no, um, a pipeline, um, you come in here. Now I'm going to show you something. Um, so I ran this code. It took about, you can see, it took about 41 minutes. Uh, and you see it, there were like a bunch of... Uh, um, bunch of operations happening, right? Each each task is an operation. So let's go look at uh, one of this machine learning output. Um, if you click here, it's going to give you the run URL. So when I click the run URL, um, what it's going to do is this is where um, Databricks internally saves the uh, logs and maintains it for us. We're going to go in there and you can see the execution and you can see what got executed. And in each cell, you will see how much time it took to execute. Um, so this is a pipeline that Data Factory created an ad hoc com compute and say like, OK, now Spark, go do this uh, computation for me and, and finish it up. And that's what it did. So you can see like for each operation, you can see the uh, how much time it took. Um, we are running a notebook job. And this is this in, so, so, so you can see how you can troubleshoot both together. So if you do this combination, um, I mean, in most cases, this is good when you are in the beginning developing and testing and things like that. Um, but when it goes to production, you mostly you're not going to see this. Rather, you log it to an app insights or something and, and troubleshoot it in that way. Uh, but as you can see, like these two environments come together. Uh, and give you an entire data lifecycle uh, management platform. So that's that's pretty much in a high level I wanted to cover. Um, if you guys want to go into deep on each topic, please do let me know. I can share you code samples and I can walk you guys through. Um, we have customer stories. Um, I mean, these are all they've been using it. I have worked for. I've worked in Data Factory for more than five years, so I know very well that this, this and all, like I was a part of this company to do this. So I can share this. These are real customer stories. Um, now I'll stop. Any questions, suggestions, thoughts? Thanks, Bala. I think this is exactly.